Hey folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today we're taking a look at this guy right here, Nexus Ops. Now this is the Avalon Hill, the original version of the game. Fantasy Flight has since come out with a upgraded version of the game, but that's really hard to find now too, so that should kind of tell you just how special the game this really is. Now, I was uh, lightheartedly confronted on the cruise uh, by a couple of uh, Dice Tower uh, listeners that uh, we talk about this game a lot. On a lot of different lists, it's popped up, and we have yet to do a review on it. So, without fact-checking that, I don't know for sure if we have or not, but I'll take the word on it. I figured, eh, why don't, why don't we go ahead and do it? We were able to play the game at on the cruise and we had a great time with it so I'm gonna go ahead and do a review of it let you know what we let you know what I think about the game uh, you probably know that it's already going to be positive since I've talked about it so much on other places but without further ado let's get down to the table I'll show you how it works So in a game of Nexus Ops, the first person to get 12 points is declared the winner, and the game would immediately end. Now, another way for the game to end is that uh, one player gets knocked out completely, uh, and then whoever has the most points at, the, at, at that point is the winner in that case. Now, how do you get points? Well, you simply get points by uh, conquering uh, winning battles, conquering different areas, and that type of thing. You're going to be having these uh, special mission cards, secret mission cards throughout the course of the game that have different kinds of uh, stipulations on them. And once you do that, you get that victory point and you just play it face up in front of you to denote that you have that victory point. You're also going to be getting victory points for uh, whenever you win a battle, you just take a victory point card, basically. It's called a mission card, but it's basically just a victory point. Uh, you also have these energized cards that you're going to be using throughout the course of the game to do different things. Uh, for example, two of your units can each move one extra space this turn, this little power-up type of cards. So then each player is going to take a turn, and in that turn, you have basically six things that you do in a specific order. And they're actually all right here on your player uh, aid sheet. You First of all, you purchase units, then you can move your units, then you reveal any exploration tiles, you conduct battles if there are any, you gain rubium for the mines that you control, and then you draw one secret mission card. If And if you control the monolith, you also draw two energized cards. So here is the monolith here in the middle of the, of the board. Your basic units can actually go up there, only your strongest units can. Uh, so basically your turn would start like this. Uh, green's going first and green starts with eight rubium. Everybody else starts with uh, more than that because going first is an advantage. Uh, so um, you, the second player will have three more. Blue player has three more than the red player and so forth and so on. So I start with eight rubium. The first thing I can do is purchase my units. Purchasing units is very simple. You simply look at the card here. Humans cost two. Fungoids cost three, uh, so do crystallines, rock striders cost six, lava leapers cost eight, and rubium dragons, the strongest unit in the uh, game, costs 12. And then this also is your battle sequence. Now, uh, we'll go over battles later though. <clears throat> What's also of note here on your sheet is that it also has all of the special abilities that your units have as well. So that's really cool things. One of the better things about the game, I think, is that every all of the information you need, what you do on your turn, how much everything costs, how much everything is in battle, it's all on one little sheet. I really like that. So the first thing I'll do is I'll purchase humans. Humans cost uh, two bucks. I want to get at least three of them. So I'm going to use six dollars uh, to purchase three of my humans. And uh, then I have two bucks less left over. Uh, let's go with um, another human uh, just to uh, stay there. All right, so now that I've purchased units, I can put them in any of my home spaces. And it doesn't matter which ones they go on, they can just go uh, anywhere they would like. All right, <clears throat> and so now that I have purchased, I'm going to move. So I'm going to move one of my dudes out here to explore, and once I've done that, I flip it over. 
Now, what this means is it's an expiration tile. This means that a two, uh, a mine that produces two rubium every turn will go here. And so I'm going to place a rubium mine there. And that is really the end of my turn because I don't have any more forces to move. I have to keep guys here so that they can mine. And this guy wants to stay there as well to mine that. So at the end of my turn, I don't have any battles to conduct. I'm going to gain rubium from the mines that I control and I have guys that can mine them. So five, four is nine. So I would gain my rubium and that would be the end of my turn. And then after everybody else has taken their turns, moved their guys, flipped over exploration tiles, found what was on there and all that kind of thing, uh, we come back to Green's turn and Green is going to take the money that they earned last turn and purchase more units. We're gonna go ahead and go with, uh, uh, let's see, two fungoids, which is six. And uh, so I got three left, so we're gonna go ahead and go with a uh, crystalline as well. And that's my money. And we're gonna put these guys right here. Uh, these guys are gonna move out. One, two, uh, three. And flip this guy over. And that becomes a one mine. And another fungoid gets to go on that place there. Um, that's what the expiration tiles on them. They'll either have uh, a bunch of different things on them. Some of the ones that have already turned over, a two mine that you already saw, uh, a one mine and a fungoid comes out, a rock strider comes out, which is kind of like a spidery type looking guy, uh, a one mine and a crystalline. Just a number of different things come out from these expiration tiles. So keep that in mind. Now uh, I have reached the limits of my movement and I now can, can take the money that I've earned. Uh, so that's seven uh, and then 10. On Green's turn, we're going to go ahead and uh, purchase uh, two humans and a rock strider for 10. And uh, we'll put these guys right here, just like so. And uh, let's see, we're going to uh, go ahead and move our units. Now we're going to, rock striders have the ability to move two if they're moving to a rock planes or through a rock planes. So we're gonna go ahead and move over here like this. And these guys are gonna come here. That guy's gonna go in there to help with that battle. And then our two fungoids are gonna come over here and explore here. And this guy will come here and explore there. So we'll pick that up and that. So that's a two mine that we got here and another rock strider right there. So that's a cool thing. And now, since we have a battle here, this is basically the only reason I did that. This is, uh, Green probably has the lesser hand here, but I wanted to show how a battle works. All right, so green and yellow are gonna go, gonna duke at it here. So we see here that, uh, both players have rock striders in the event. If we look at the player aid here, the flow of fighting goes from the Rubium Dragon always attacks first and the Lava Leaper and then the Rock Strider and on down the line. So the Rubium Dragon will always fight first, the human will always fight last. All right, so the Rock Striders will hit first and then Yellow's Crystalline will get a shot and then the human, if he's still alive, will also get a shot. Now, here we have also the Rock Striders always hit on a four. The Crystallines always hit on a five plus, but since we're in a crystal uh, forest, then they actually hit on a uh, four plus. And then humans are just, you know, they're basic dudes. They, they are barely in the fight. They're gonna hit on a six plus. All right, so um, uh, the, let's say that green is black and white is yellow. We roll the dice and green hits. The yellow one doesn't. So then the person who is defending gets to choose who, uh, which one they lose. So since that guy hasn't even hit yet, we're gonna go ahead and lose the Rock Strider so we can hopefully get a hit here. Um, now the Crystalline gets to roll by himself and gets a three plus. Now he needs a four plus to actually score a hit so he doesn't actually score a hit. Then the human will get to fight back and oh my goodness, he actually hits. So the crystalline is dead as well. They have, green has won the battle. And so we get to take one of these blue mission cards, which means that I now have one point. Uh, check my 
Uh, my my secret missions says destroy a rock strider in battle. We did destroy a rock strider in this battle, so I also put that one down as two points as well. So now green has three points neat, uh, towards the 12 that are necessary, and uh, we continue playing like that. The board will get tighter and tighter with each turn because players are moving in and uh, trying to secure more uh, ground as they go throughout the game and that's basically how Nexus Op plays. It's it's pretty quick. You could probably get a game in in about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, something like that. And it's it's a really cool area control game. So let's get to my final thoughts. So that is Nexus Ops. A really fun game actually. Uh, it, it's uh, I love the look of the game. The translucent pieces uh, that are on it are great. The monolith is the one thing about the game that I'm really kind of, wow, couldn't they have done something better? Uh, so <laughs> there is that, but that's really a, a very small minor nitpick. Uh, all of the figures are, are really neat. They're very sturdy, very durable. You don't got to worry about them breaking or anything like that, at least with the Avenal Hill version. Now, I, I've never eat, I've never actually purchased the Fantasy Flight version, so I can't really give much commentary on a comparison between the two. I, I'm pretty sure, however, that not many of the rules have changed. So if you can pick up a copy of the Fantasy Flight one, that would be good for you. I think the pe the pieces that are in this game are a little bit better as far as the actual, uh, you know, these translucent guys here. Um, but, you know, that's just me. You, you could be uh, completely disagree with me on that. However, uh, finding an Avalon Hill version might be rather difficult. I don't know, though, because I haven't done this searching. I've got my copy, so I don't need to look for another one. Uh, but anyway, the idea behind this game is just a very fast-paced, area control battle type game. Uh, it's got a pretty unique battle system. No, I wouldn't say unique. It's got a, um, I don't know, I guess at the time it was a little bit unique where uh, the, the units kind of uh, followed a path of uh, battle and, you know, the strongest units always attacked first and the we weaker units, the humans, always attack last. And so there was a little bit of, um, you had to really pay attention, uh, attention to attrition because you know, you, you might lose a unit that you could roll a die for later on in that turn. You, do you want to lose a unit that has already rolled its die? Another thing that was cool about it is that battles can end in a draw. You only do one round of combat, and then whoever is, uh, if, if there's only one person's models left in the hex, well, then they've won the battle. But if there are models from more than one player there, it's a draw, and it stays that way until, the, until that next person's turn. And then the battle continues on their turn. I really liked that uh, a lot, actually, because um, it gives you a kind of a feeling of, you know, I'm not... I'm not out of the fight yet. I, I, I've still got a chance to win, and I really did enjoy that. Um, each of the units have, have a pretty uh, different feel. Fungoids um, are the second weakest unit, but they're actually uh, stronger if they're in the, um, what do you call them, the liquid fungus forests, um, because that's their home territory, so to speak. That's the environment that they fight best in. The crystal spires hexes are better for the crystalline figures. Um, the humans are just bad. <laughs> they're just bad all over the place because they're just little, you know, munchy, uh, hard on the outside, soft on the inside, uh, little chew toys for all of the bigger monsters that are roaming around on this planet. Uh, the rock striders, I think, are probably the, the, the most solid fighting unit in the, in the, uh, game. They're, they're not, ex they're not great, but they're, they're also just very consistent. They're always, uh, good. Uh, the Lava Leapers are really, really good on the Lava Spaces, and then the Rubium Dragons are just awesome, especially if you can get one up to the Monolith. He can move anywhere on the board at that point and join any battle he wants to. Plus, he's kind of an artillery unit where he can shoot a plasma bomb into an adjacent thing without actually causing a battle to commence or anything like that. So each of the units are really neat. I, I, I like the individuality that each of them have, but it's not over the board and convoluted and complex or anything like that. It's just very simple, but yet very different at the same time. And that's what I think is the best thing about this game. It stays so simple. I mean, if you look at the rule book here, it is uh, practically non-existent 
by today's standards. And so just a really cool game. If you can find a copy of this, I cannot more highly uh, encourage you to go get it uh, because it is really one of those gems from the past that if you can get your hands on it now, I think you will not be disappointed. So with me, this gets two thumbs way up. Uh, of course, you already kind of knew that because I've talked about it so much. But uh, Nexus Ops, either the Avalon Hill version or the Fantasy Flight version, if you can find a copy, go get it because I don't think you'll be disappointed. See you guys on the flip side.